everyone very much for coming tonight. I'm going to do a quick switch of the project of the computers in a second, but I'd like to get everything started out in action. And the first thing that we're going to do is you're going to talk to someone that you don't know. So in a moment, I'm going to give you some directions. You're going to find someone you don't know, and you're going to get some post-it notes. Uh, and in this session, it's going to be very hands-on. It's going to be very interactive. We're going to use post-it notes and Sharpies, and we're going to use these sheets of white paper on the walls today. So find someone that you don't know in a moment. Introduce yourself to this person, to who you are, where you work, you know, what your job is. That's interesting. But most importantly, what I would like you to do and get in groups of two or three, talk about what did you come here to learn about the topic around product ownership, around innovation, maybe about market disruption, right? And write down some questions that you would like me to answer by the end of tonight, or maybe during the open spaces, maybe we don't talk about them during this session, that's fine, but we could talk about them further in the open spaces. So uh, find a partner, once you find your partner, each of you get a packet of post-it notes and a Sharpie, and you'll have four minutes to make a short introduction, and but really spend most of your time talking about what types of questions you would like answered, and write down the questions on the post-it notes. One question per post-it note. Each group try to come up with at least two. All right, go. Find a partner and then get the post-it notes. Someone you don't know. How can you help me to build this? Innovation game, right? Because you're here to learn about innovation games. I'm going to demonstrate one, a very common one used for road mapping. Then we are going to learn. Then we're going to do some more games. But I want to demonstrate this one. I'm going to use your questions as the raw materials for this game. So a little bit about me. My name is Carlton Nettleton. Uh, I am a certified Scrum trainer. I've been involved with agile software development since 2001. I used to be an extreme programmer a long time ago. Uh, and then around 2009, I became a consultant and trainer that helps organizations and teams unleash creativity within the teams. Uh, but also to create new and innovative products. My interest these days, I got started in Teams, uh, started with, do, do a lot of work with Scrum, but I'm really interested in like, how do we in product development? Right? I think that's really kind of the interesting uh, realm because like, there's a lot of opportunities if you use some uh, simple techniques to create innovative products, practical products that are disruptive to the market. And it's really, in, in my belief is, if that information is with your users, right? They and you just have to ask them the right questions, and they will tell you what is disruptive, right? And you've got to apply your insight and judgment. Uh, but a lot of what you need to do is you have to get out there, you have to talk to users, and you have to engage your technical team members because they are a lot of very they are very creative people. They have a lot of interesting ideas around the technology. Uh, they can understand something. Uh, they understand a little bit about the trends where the technology is going. And sometimes, if you engage them, they're like extra helpers to get to go out there and talk to users and customers and to help you generate insights. Um, I'm originally from San Diego, California, but I now live here in Portugal. I live right up there by Peralto, Pula uh, dos Catanos. I've been living here for six weeks, officially. Let's see what else. That's uh, about me. A basic I've been traveling as a consultant trainer. I've worked all over the world. Uh, multiple times in Portugal, as some people uh, uh, have known, but I've gone to Chile, Argentina, not Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, uh, different parts in Europe, China, India, New Zealand. I've done work in a lot of different organizations. I'm really glad to be here supporting this community. Uh, I'm glad to be here also as a scrum trainer helping support this community because that's part of one of my jobs is to help the community grow. And uh, it's nice to see that the community is growing here in Lisbon. If there's anything I can do to help that, I, you know, I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's start doing Prune the Product Tree. And it is a, it's an innovation game. I'll give you a little more. Uh, an innovation game is based on a book by Luke Coleman. We'll see that in a little bit. Uh, and they are collaborative, serious type games that you play with your customers to help them give you deeper insights into the products. 
right? And the idea behind the innovation games is rather than guessing what the customers want, you go and ask them. And we'll talk about why we play games a little bit later. I want to demonstrate one called Prune the Product Tree. And it has a very simple visual metaphor. It is you have a, you have a tree like this, and you can put your features, you can put your requirements. In our case, we're going to put our questions in this tree. And the position where we put the questions tells us something about uh, where we should develop it in our product life cycle. All right, so there's three regions in this tree. You've got your roots, you've got your trunk, branches, and then you have the canopy, right? So this represents the foundation of your tree, right? You can't have a tree without roots. So there's gonna be some questions that you have that are foundational. There are some questions that are core related to this topic. And there are questions that are out on the future edge of growth of this topic. We may not cover them tonight. They might be covered in the open space. They might be something that we cover. We could cover them. Don't know, right? So I want to gather all your questions and I'm going to put them on the tree to kind of demonstrate what proving the product tree looks like. So let's start. Let's have some people from the back stand up and hand me their questions. But people in the front, give me your questions, please. I've, I've never done this before, so I, this could work or it could be a big flop. <laughs> I'm not going to read all the questions because that will be a little bit uh, a little boring, but I'll read some of them. How can a product owner help build a disruptive product? What is a disruptive product to you? Uh, how can you organize yourself in the Thank you. Learn about collaborative techniques. How do innovation games work? How do we get the games in the company? Thank you. Oh, I got that one. How to create a disruptive product. Is it better to have product owners, a product, have product owners or a product owner? What are innovation games? That's foundational. What are, what's the R about? Oh, why is it R? Got that. All right. Here you go. How to involve a client into Scrum or others? How to translate market needs into product sessions. How to change the mind of not agile teams to agile. How do you manage design sprints or other material? How do you increase productivity? How do you become a product owner? What different stakeholders have conflicting interests and push to the PO? Understand how others do it, get insights and best practices. All right, uh, are there any more questions? Did I have any questions in the back? All right, so this was a real quick way of, I was just sorting the questions to give myself some understanding of where, what, what do you want to know, right? We are, we're using it visually so I can get a sense of where I need to go. So this is the foundation, this is kind of the core, and this is kind of the future edge. So maybe these topics aren't really related to the discussion tonight. I mean, there are questions you want to answer. We'll try to answer them because they're in the areas of the the furthest growth, but I think we got to start on these first. So what's the R about? Learn about collaborative techniques, what are innovation games, how do they work? How do we get games in the company to disrupt? Uh, it's about product ownership. Notice I'm looking at things that cluster. So when you play visual collaboration, this is what's called a visual collaboration game. It, the idea is that you have a visual metaphor and what you're taking are you have post-it notes, right? And the post-it notes are, it's essentially affinity grouping, right? But we have a visual metaphor that we're laying over top of it. So affinity grouping was the old classic, hey, let's write things on a post-it note, put things that are the same next to one another, right? Everyone knows how to do that here if you're involved in product management. What we're doing here is now we're saying, okay, in addition to the affinity grouping, we have a metaphor and there are regions in here. Right? The region here is roots, our core, and future growth. Right? And uh, so these are kind of the core questions that I have here. How to create a disruptive product? How can the product owner build a disruptive product? What is a disruptive product? So these are kind of related to one another here. How to involve a client, Scrum, or others? Uh, that 
might actually be out here. How can you organize yourselves in agile lean management? Another thing that you could talk about here with a visual collaboration game like Prune the Product Tree is because you can have <coughs> branches of growth. So you can start like this, and here's how do we involve the client into Scrum or other, right? The next topic is how can you organize yourself and others with an agile and lean management? It's almost like an extension, right? And so the way that you organize the post-it notes in Prune the Product Tree in itself can tell you information about how the tree will grow. Right? Uh, how to translate the market needs into product decisions with different stakeholders and conflicting interests. How to increase product productivity, design sprints. Yeah, these things are all and change. These aren't necessarily the core of this topic tonight, which is innovation and product ownership. This is change the mind of non-agile teams, manage design sprints. Maybe that could be here on the edge. Increase productivity. Maybe a little bit beyond the scope of this. Understand how others do it. I think actually that could belong in here. Uh, kind of related to design sprints, right? Because I think that is core. So sometimes part of this also is the dialogue, having that conversation. Hey, understanding how others do that, is that really future growth way out the edge or is that core? I think that would be kind of core to this discussion tonight, right? That's one of the important things that people want to understand is, hey, what are some different ways that the people here are using these concepts around innovation and these concepts around product ownership? And the key when you have, when you play a visual collaboration game like Prove the Product Tree is the dialogue, right? All of these innovation games are a way to have a dialogue either with your customers and users, that's the ideal, or within your own design team, right? And this layout of these post-it notes that's an outcome of the dialogue. It helps facilitate the dialogue uh, with your teams, okay? What more would you like to know at this point around this demo of Prune the Product Tree? Yes? So in, in here you uh, basically uh, use your good judgment to, to distribute the, the yes. process into the, the, the three areas. Mm -hmm. How would we usually use this technique in a collaborative way? Uh, so what I would I would I would do with the client if so there's a couple things that I would do and I have I it's interesting I I can think of one way internally and externally so internal if you're trying to you have a set of requirements that you want to put into a product and you work maybe with your developers and your uh, stakeholders and they work collaboratively and say okay let's figure out where these require all these requirements go are they in the core are the, uh, not core, in the roots, right? They're, they're required to support core functionality, right? Is it core functionality here? Or is this distant growth, right? Is this something that maybe we'll do in version 1.1, version two, right? And so we just write down these ideas on post-it notes and we have a dialogue and we say, okay, put them where you think they go. And sometimes it, I will mix the groups up with maybe developers and stakeholders together Sometimes I'll have developers in one group and stakeholders in a different group, right? And they'll make their own trees, and then they'll discuss the differences between them. All right, it, there's a lot of different ways to think about how to do this collaboratively. Uh, one time I had a client do this with their customers, and they put, they, what they had is this picture here, the blue line like this, around all, everything that they thought was core functionality, and they realized that it looked like this. <laughs> like, oh yeah, you know, our tree kind of looks like this. I said, draw a line about what you think is the core functionality, what you think is MVP. And they drew something like this. And I said to them, I said, well, is there any of these things, you don't have anything that supports huge growth. So maybe some of the things that you think are core, like your minimally viable product, either is not that you could move out to here, or you haven't thought through this enough and you need to think about how you're going to grow this product beyond the MVP, All right? So, and then that was an interesting conversation that they had, which was, okay, do we need more requirements, or what we think is core, can we actually move it to the next release? All right. What more would people like to know about this demo?
Have you ever got to a point where uh, the, the the things that are uh, around the tree, uh, the management uh, told you uh, from the start that well, let's forget about this because we only have like six months to develop the product. So when you are putting these functionalities here, mm -hmm. you're you're automatically uh, killing them because this is a six month cycle of development and we, we will never get there. Well, I mean, that's a business decision, right? That's their choice. <coughs> so the question is, well, has there ever been a conversation where anything that's outside of core of the management will say, well, we're not gonna build that because it's beyond our time horizon. No. That's their choice, right? But remember, I mean, if they want to grow and have this product, you know, make more money, they got to think about how do you have this future growth, right? I mean, if there's a, and, and I, I, you know, I will point out like, hey, you've got a problem here. Or for instance, like this tree is slightly uneven, right? There's nothing here. There's nothing here. The idea also you want to think about is how do you grow your product symmetrically, right? When I might point out to that client if they were telling me that conversation, I say, hey, well, listen your tree is lopsided, right? You have big gaps in your understanding. It's, it's quite interesting I see when I see people play this game with post-it notes. Uh, when there's lack of symmetry, it does reflect a lack of understanding of what the product's supposed to do. It's not random. People, it, it looks random, but generally like there's like a big gap. And there's probably some gaps in these questions. Again, this is a demo, so I'm not going to dive too much into the content. But generally, if this tree looks on, look, lacks symmetry, then there are gaps in understanding of what the product's supposed to do. Not always, but yes. How do you deal with uh, out of scope? Out of scope? Uh, so, well, this is a this is an open. It depends on how you want to handle this. So I've done this activity once. Uh, where it's like, okay, here are all the fixed things that we want you to put onto the tree. We give the client or the end users about 15 to 20 post-it notes with pre-populated ideas. So there is no out of scope. It's like, here are the ideas that we want you to place on the tree. Tell us where you think they belong. Or you can do it completely open. That really depends on what you're trying to discover with the client, right? Are you trying to capture their ideas, new ideas? then technically nothing's out of scope. You just may not build it, <laughs> right? Uh, I've also done it a little bit more, not completely open-ended, like here's some post-it notes, just write anything you want. What I will do is say here are 10 or 15 that we're interested in knowing about. If you have some additional ideas, don't worry if they're in or out of scope, just tell us, you know, if you think something's missing, write it down and put it on the tree. Again, that's up for the product designers to define if it's out of scope or not, right? Just because it's on the tree doesn't mean it's going to be built. Right? Maybe set expectations about that too. One more question, then I want to move on. Uh, I want to move on. So you um, talked about symmetry. Uh, yes. Probably I missed something, but what is the difference on the uh, feature on the left and on the right? On the uh, there's no, there's no difference <coughs> in, in the features on the left or the right. I just, it, when you think about the metaphor, and, and so I, I met Luke Homan, uh, he's a mentor of my own. He literally thinks of trees, pr pruning trees. This metaphor of pruning the product tree comes from his backyard where he has a bunch of lemon trees and plum trees. They're very common in California, you have fruit trees in your backyard. And he's always out there pruning the trees. And so the, to have a healthy tree, it needs to be balanced, right? So when, there's no difference in, in here, but if you notice that there's gaps in the tree, the tree's not very symmetrical, so it's not very healthy, it's not very complete. Uh, but there's no meaning in left or right or anything like that. It's more about the clustering of the ideas. It's, right? it's the clustering of the ideas, the growth from one idea to the other. Like here we go right here, let me, let me point this out. So what, how can we help a product owner to build a disruptive product? What is a disruptive product for, for you? How to create a disruptive product? What goes on after this? This is like a whole stream of questions and then it just stops, right? Okay, that, that would seem to me, if this was like a product or feature that we were talking about, or, or what's the next question, right? How do we monetize a disruptive product, right? That would be something that's like, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting, that's future growth. We need to answer that question. Maybe not in this session. Right. That's what I'm talking about, the symmetry. You notice the gaps. 
I think it was the last question. Yeah, yeah, I'll hear it. <laughs> From your experience, what, uh, how, for how uh, long uh, do people put up? Play the game? Yeah, play game. So, 15 to 20 minutes, and then I would have the people who played the game give you 5 to 10 minutes to tell you about what they created and for you to ask questions. Again, it's about that dialogue. Ask questions uh, about if, if it's not clear to you, right? And, and sometimes I've worked with people, like you look at the way that these are posted, like this is here, this is here, and I ask, is, does this have meaning to you? Is this first, this is second, this is third? Some groups will say, no, there's no meaning whatsoever in that. Other groups will say, yes, this is number one, this is number two, this is number three. So it's important to ask the questions because there's other information that's encoded in here. All right. Move on to this. I'm doing this old school, folks, because I actually don't, uh, I don't use PowerPoint very often. So this is what we're going to learn today. What is a product owner? What are innovation games? What makes a successful product owner? And how will I apply what I learned at work? All right, and we've already started one innovation game. Can someone just hit that space bar? I'll do the, all right, so product owner. So uh, I like to think of the product owner has kind of three roles. And the product owner has this really important role in Scrum. It's very simple, they own the product backlog. <laughs> right, it's like, okay, <laughs> well what does that mean, right? So they, they are a visionary, right? They think about, hey, where do I find the value? Right, and I like that idea of a pirate because sometimes the value is hidden, right? And you've got to kind of get out there and try to scan the horizon, work with other people. You got to have friends that help you. Product owner is classically described in Scrum as kind of a solitary role, but I don't think that's very successful because it's too much responsibility and there's too much work for one person. So product owner has to have a bunch of people helping them. But they've got to, they're thinking about the product owner is, how do I grow the company? How do we bring more value to our customers and users, right? And, and that's a really, really important job, to be a product visionary and a business leader, okay? Next, what we talk about here is, the, I like to use this concept of a bridge. So the product owner is the bridge between two types of people, stakeholders and techie nerdy people, right? And the product owner helps bridge that communication between two groups that are very different. The product owner, I sometimes like to think about them as being a translator, so they can operate in the world of the stakeholders, and that typically is very strategic, business-oriented. Product owner also operates in the world of the tech people, which is very tactical, very technically oriented. <clears throat> but they're more, uh, like I said, this connector between the two. Uh, and, and, this, and I like to sometimes say that they're a translator between the two. They can speak both languages, right? Now the product owner isn't an expert in technical work, right? That's what they have the team for. But their job is to help sh communicate the needs and the requirements and the priorities of the stakeholders to the technical people, all right? And if we move on to the next one, thank you. I like to say they are the decider. Uh, they're the judge. They get to decide what is valuable or not, right? And so the product owner has been given a great deal of authority and power to make choices on what gets built and what are the priorities, right? The stakeholders, the product, the, the stakeholders have given the product owner the authority to make choices for them when they cannot decide, right? And this is very, very important. Right? The product owner has to have that power. Otherwise, they're not the product owner, right? And so the product owner is a visionary, right? business visionary. They are a connector between two groups of people, and they are a decider. Right? Those are the key roles. Now, in classic Scrum, the product owner is the owner of the product backlog. The product owner is there to help review the product during sprint review. They also participate in sprint planning to help the team understand, hey, what are the goals and objectives? for the, uh, the, the spread, right? So they're, they're really helping set what needs to get, the direction of what needs to get built, what are the goals, and they co-create the product with the team, right? The product owner isn't the boss of the team, 
right? They're really just the, both of the both the team and the product owner and scrum work together to say, okay, how do we satisfy the needs of the customer? How do we deliver more value? Okay, that's my next slide. I don't next. Okay, so let's talk then a little bit more about what our innovation games. So we did one. So now I, I want to talk more about the innovation games. The innovation games. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Yeah. So we got a picture here of the comes from a book. Uh, the book is by Luke Holman. That's a picture of Luke. And the idea here, the innovation games, is we want to engage our customers and users in a structured, facilitated activity uh, to help us generate insights. And there's there's kind of three reasons why we play games. Can we move to the next slide? So in the book, there are 12 games. These are all the 12 classic innovation games. Where's Prune the Product Trees? Right there, right down at the bottom. And there's 11 other innovation games. Uh, we, I don't know which other ones we're going to play. So where's the ones I want to play? We're going to play the Speedboat next, which is a very simple game to play. You're going to play it in a moment in groups. Uh, and then we'll see how much time we have left if we're going to play a different game. We might do a prioritization game after this. It's not an innovation game, but it comes from a different source. So innovation games were started by Luke Holman. He's Silicon Valley. I think he wrote that book originally in 2005. And the idea is you work with your customers and your end users, and that's the point of the innovation games, right? You talk to real customers, real end users, in these different types of techniques. And the, there's three reasons to play these games. One of them is when you put uh, customers and users into a game format. And I once worked with a bank, they didn't play games. They were really serious because it's fun. So I said, well, this is a new facilitation technique. I go, oh, okay, we'll do that. Right. So, but the idea of the game is that you get them into a relaxed environment. Right? We've trained our stakeholders, our customers, our end users to behave a certain way when we sit in a room around a conference table and talk about requirements or features or priorities, right? Everyone gets all serious and they're like, well, we gotta look at the screen and we have to have all our specs and our docs and whatever it is, right? And so you don't really get a lot of innovation. When you put people in a game environment, and when you say, hey, here are some post-it notes and some uh, Sharpies, or when you play buy a feature, you actually use money, not euros, like fake money, right? Uh, people kind of become curious, like, well, what are we gonna do with this <coughs> fake money here? Or when you do something like show and tell, when you bring product artifacts to the office, <coughs> to tell you stories about how that's being used. People become kind of curious, they let down their guard, and they tell you things they wouldn't normally tell you in that normal, hey, let's sit around the conference table, 15 people for an hour, and talk about the, the priorities. Right, you, they, they're unsure how to behave, so they inadvertently reveal things that are insights. Right, how they use the product, the things that are kind of bothering them about the product. Right, and, and the idea of the games puts them in an environment where they'll tell you more than they would in a normal conversation. The other th reason why we play games is because in addition to verbal communication, there is written communication, right? This is persistent. There's nonverbal communication, right? In the sense that you can observe how the people, players interact in the games. Right, you can see which, which people, so these people here are playing games, they're a bunch of customers, and these three people all talk to one another, and they don't talk to these other three people. That's really interesting. Well, these three people over here, maybe they are all from the same uh, region, right? And these folks here, they're from different regions, right? And so there's some sort of affinity grouping that isn't really obvious when maybe you exchange conversations through email or when you come to a customer summit, right? And so you get to learn different nonverbal things as well when you observe how the players interact during the games. And then the last reason why we play games is they tend to be fun. Uh, what I recommend with the innovation games is use them to increase the fun factor. Get the games engage people uh, with curiosity because they're different. We have people get up and move around. We have people talk to one another, right? And that just kind of raises the fun level, right? 
So three reasons to play the games. They're fun. They have much more information than just written, or much more information than just verbal communication or written communication. There's many modes that product designers can leverage. Oftentimes, you'll take pictures of the of the results, or even possibly make videos if that's allowed by your customers and users. Uh, and then the last idea is that we want to get the customers into a different type of environment so perhaps that they would give, it, give you new insights that they wouldn't normally in a normal business environment. Okay? Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So let's move on to a different innovation. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to go on to a different innovation, Speedboat. This one's one you're going to uh, break up into groups. So Speedboat is a, is a different, uh, actually before I do that, I'll ask some questions. What sort of questions, what sort of information would you like to know about innovation games? And I can look at the questions here, but are there other questions that people have about innovation games? Yes? How can you incentivize customers to want to play these games? Uh, well, what I would say, there's a couple of ways to do it. The first one I would say is uh, use Speedboat. Speedboat's the easiest game, we're going to play it in a second, uh, to incentivize the customers to play because Speedboat is all about finding out what your customers don't like about your product or service. Right? You will not be able to play any other innovation game unless you've done that one first, pretty much. Because everything they don't like about your product, say for instance, it's too slow or it uh, has lots of bugs and you want to play this game here, which is about road mapping, uh, it's just going to end up in here. So they'll put things like, hey, there's lots of bugs in the product. I need you to fix those first. Or it's too slow. I'm going to put that down here. So Speedboat is a way to capture their complaints before you can play more advanced games. The thing with Speedboat is, though, you need to follow through on what they identify as complaints to show them like, oh wow, they told, I told them I wanted them to fix this, and they fixed it. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, yes? What if you are creating a new product? Uh, yeah, okay, what's the second question? <laughs> what if you <laughs> no, create a new product and what? You said it's to discover what the clients don't like about to the product. If you are creating a new product. There's a different game for that. So can we go back one? So there's a couple of things that I would do if I was creating a brand new product. One, if you were going to stick with the classic innovation game, I would say start your day. So I would start your day is about tell me how you use maybe some existing products currently. So you're trying to get a sense of what is the client doing currently because you're trying to generate insights and ways to figure out uh, how their current products don't serve their needs. That might be a way to think about it. Uh, let me think about what else that I would use here. If you're going to do a new product, you could say give them a, you could use give them a hot tub. Give them a hot tub and say, hey, let's give some people something crazy. Uh, you know, for instance, the metaphor is, uh, you know, come up with an idea of like, well, what if we were building a new apartment complex and in the lobby we had a hot tub? What are some other things that you could put in the hot tub that's just, or in the apartment complex that's crazy? For instance, you could have a, a robot that walks on one stop. Right? The idea is that when you're coming up with a new product, you want to try to get crazy ideas. right? If you were to go beyond the innovation games and go more into, uh, new, into value, I would go into new value proposition design and create a customer profile. So understand what are the customer's jobs, what are their pains, what are their gains, and use that information to help you generate insight into what's, what sort of product and service can we provide them. But you'd have to be kind of targeted you know, around a, a little bit around well, what's our demographic, what do we think the product wants. Is that helpful? Okay. So start your day, maybe hot tub or uh, customer profiles from value proposition design. Another question. Another question around innovation games. All right, let me see if I got, so why is there an R on the innovation games? The R means it's just a registered trademark. The t phrase innovation games is a registered trademark of those. So, uh, collaborative techniques, what are innovation games? How do the games get the 
company disruption. All right, uh, this question is, a, who's going to this question? How do we get the games to disruption? Yes, is that a question answered for you or are you looking for something else? Um, it was more about like how the games get you to a disruptive growth. Um, okay. Like I think before you're able to answer that, it's a little bit about describing what the disruptive growth would be and then you can answer that. Uh, so to me, when I think about dis disruptive product, it's one that is changes your market, or changes you know changes your changes your market, or changes the profitability of the of, of your uh, product or service in a way. To me, like you know, orders of magnitude, right? That you're able to make orders of magnitude more profit from it, or deliver orders of magnitude more value to your customers. Disruptive uh, for, I had a client once that was working using Scrum and Agile because they were afraid of being disruptive, being disrupted by, um, by competitors. So they were developing training systems that were, I'll tell you this, they were green screens. Like they, were, they weren't even like Windows or web apps, right? It was like a green screen emulator. It used to be old Fortran systems. And they were like, we, if, we could be totally disrupted by all our competitors because we have a technology that is so old, we have to bring in you know, modern client server web applications. This was like in the mid 2000s, right? <laughs> uh, so they were, they were looking for how do we get new ideas into our products so we aren't disrupted by competitors. And so you know, your customers are just gone. They don't use your products anymore because you've been disrupted. The market moves. Uh, to me, another type of disruption is when a whole industry is dying. So you think about film, right? I mean, digital cameras did away with Kodak, which was a, a massive American company that existed for almost a century. They were just disrupted. And Kodak actually discovered digital, digital technology, right? So that's what I'm thinking about disruption. <coughs> whole industries are gone, or whole markets just disappear. Yes? Better? Uh, yes, and how do the games get you there? So the games get you there by helping you give, increase the likelihood that you're going to find that insight more so than your your competitors, right? Your competitors don't use games, right? I'll just tell you that right now. A lot of, a lot of organizations don't use games. They, they think they know what the market wants, and so they give it to the market. Rather than with the games where you go to the market, the customers and users, and you can engage them in a dialogue, say, okay, what is it you want? What are your challenges? What types of problems are you experiencing? The games don't produce disruption. You have to, you have to, the games get you in a place where you can maybe find the insight, right? But you have to be there and you have to be paying attention. Better? Okay. Uh, how do innovation games work? How do innovation games work? Are you good? Okay, excellent. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about is it better to have product owners or a product owner? Um, and how to become a product owner. So to become a product owner is pretty simple, right? Someone says, hey, you're the product owner, right? <laughs> There's training, if you want to take a training class, uh, you know, I can offer a training class. You can find some from other instructors. I mean, to become a product owner, you have to start doing the job, right? And you have to be that. What's good? Yes. I'll answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I was just asking if you're like already a project manager. Uh -huh. Are you close enough to be a product owner? No. <coughs> right. And, and the reason why I say no is generally many project managers, not all, don't aren't really those business visionaries. They might be the connector, sure, that's fine. They might be the decider, right, because project managers, managers get to decide things. But they aren't necessarily responsible for growing and extending the business and building up new opportunities, generally. That's not to say no project managers do that, but in the types of organizations I see, that's not common. Uh, but they're like two out of three, right? Is that your question? Okay. No, no, that's not my question. <laughs> yeah, answer my question. All right. Uh, is it better to so become a product owner? 
uh, start doing the job, right? I think that's a good way to do it. I think to become a product owner, many product owners come from the world of product management, right? So if you're a product manager now, you probably might be a good candidate to be a product owner, right? Uh, product owners often, in my experience, in large organizations, and, and a lot of organizations do product ownership differently, but in a large organization, have like, you know, with multiple products, you might have a product manager that is responsible for something from all the way from ideation to delivery. And a product owner might think about the software piece. Just the software piece and the things that are adjacent to the software piece. Now you can have product owners that span the entire, you know, all the way from ideation to delivery. You can, right? But when product owners work with product managers, it's, it, sometimes the product owners are more focused on just the software piece. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, is it better to have a product owners or product owner? So in Scrum, there is only one product owner. You don't have multiple product owners, you don't have a committee. But product owners will work with in teams of designers, developers, maybe work with product managers to figure out, hey, what do we need to build, All right? Uh, and look, lead to these people to figure out what are the priorities, but the product owner gets that final say. Sometimes people will call this the product owner team, that's fine, uh, but you know, the team only has one decider, right? And that's really important. If you don't have a product owner you can't decide, it's, it's you know, almost better off not even have a product owner. For really large products, and this, you know, you can have, uh, there's a metaphor called area product owners, right? And so I have a client that I'm working with right now. They have multiple verticals uh, with, um, with different types of uh, markets that they're focusing it on. So they're focusing on, um, what are the verticals that they have? They have something related to um, mobile apps, and then they have the desktop apps, right? Those are the different verticals for these, these markets that are uh, attacking. And then they have one product owner. So they have area product owners, somewhat around the technologies, and then they have a, a one product owner who's thinking of the, uh, the whole business, okay? Let's see. How can the product owner help to build a disruptive product? Really help work with the teams. This is one of the things I like to think about. Product owners build disruptive products by creating the environment so that we can engage the developers, we can engage the designers, and, and encourage the business to go talk to customers and users. Okay? Yes, just a question. Uh, on that scenario, wouldn't that uh, PO, the, like the big PO that's that one. Couldn't that be a program manager or even a product manager as well? Uh, so this person could be a product manager, yes. Program manager, again, if we're thinking like a program manager is someone who leads multiple projects or programs, probably not. I'd have to understand more about that scenario, be, again, because we're thinking about delivering a value rather than the execution of a project or program. Uh, tip, when I see this type of organization, what you see are uh, executives, you know, you know, mm -hmm. the, the vice global vice president of a product, and these people are uh, product, you know, product managers for like a global vertical, right? These people are significant people in the organization making these decisions, business leaders making these decisions. Okay, so let's let's do speed. Let's move on to speedboat. Let's do another game. And it, speedboat is a game about talking about what's what's hard, what's challenging. And the idea and the metaphor we're going to use here is speedboat. And we're going to talk about product disruption, product development. Okay, and we're going to form three groups. You know, we've got an a easel right there. We're going to have this one here, and I'm going to put another one over here in a second. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to imagine our product development, our product disruption, and, and developing disruptive products. It's like the speedboat. It's going to go really, really fast. And we're going to make amazing products, things that our users love, right? And we're going to make we're going to deliver tons of value. We're going to make a lot of money doing it. But there's some stuff holding us back, right? And we're going to represent those as anchors, right? Right? The boat. We would. There are certain things in our organizations or the way that we work that hold us back from developing those products that users love, that hold us back from market disruption. And we're going to identify those on post-it notes, each idea, one per post-it note. And we're going to write them down and then place them on this picture. And, and they're going to be anchors. Anchors that are down here are really big anchors. Maybe they're attached to the bottom of the ocean. They are slowing the boat down a lot. They're really bad. They're really <coughs> big things that are preventing us from building innovative products. Right here, they're not so bad. We can deal with these. They're, they're minor irritations. And then in the middle, in this zone, these are difficult problems and challenges that you struggle with every week. Right? This, is, this here is like, hey, this happens occasionally. Not a big deal. I can cope with this. This is stuff I struggle with every week that prevents me from building really cool products that are preventing us from finding just the disrupt market disruption. And here, these are the things that are massively holding us back structurally, organizationally, and culturally. Okay? So we're gonna, let's form three groups. Each group's going to need some post-it notes and some markers. So let's do that real quickly. Three groups. One group here, one group over here. Às vezes a sua vida pessoal e sempre que não pode nos favorecer se você é CEO, de repente tem gêmeos na sua Às vezes isso pode atrapalhar. Isso é essencialmente como você faz o speedboat. Agora, há mais um passo que você faria, que nós não vamos fazer porque isso é apenas uma demo. O que você faria, então, aos jogadores, ou aos participantes, é dizer quais desses anchors, se nós cortarmos, would make the most difference on making the boat go forward. Right? Would give the boat, make the boat really fast. And there's a lot of different ways. You can just ask them to circle them. You can use like a dot voting or multi voting or sticker voting approach. Or you can just say, hey, X them off. What you really want to find out is you want to have the customers or the users tell you which of these are most important to them. Because thinking about this in the context of product development, say, hey, what is it you don't like about our product? They give you a lot of ideas, like that group there, like, whoa, that's a lot of stuff to work on, right? Where do you start? Right. Ask the customers, right? Ask the customers. All value is with the customer. And usually you just have to ask them. And, you know, you set the expectation. Just say, you know, tell us what you would like us to remove from here if this is holding you back from, you know, your product or service. Um, insights. What sort of insights do people get by playing this game? Anything that they thought either about uh, about the topic itself, around innovation, or anything about playing games? Did you have any new ideas? Let's just hear you know one or two ideas from each group. Any sort of insights and new ideas that popped up. See the value of the. This clearly illustrates the value of having a metaphor while having the, the discussion. Mm -hmm. They have the information in their minds. Mm -hmm. This really helps them uh, prioritize or mm -hmm. crystallize what they're thinking yep. by having a metaphor. Yep. Metaphor is very powerful because it really helps people, like, it just gives them something to latch onto. Yep. That's why it's a, And you can have any sort of visual collaboration game has any sort of metaphor. I, do, I have done a visual collaboration game prioritization with city planning. Right? Well, you had the street level, things that would make you see every day. Below the city, the street level was like infrastructure, and then the high rises were things in the future, city in the future. Here are a bunch of ideas that we want to plan for your city. All right, metaphor just really helped people get it, like, oh, okay, got it. What else? 
What other insights <coughs> over there from that group? Anyone have an insight from that group? There's more than an open question and an insight. Okay, so question's you, good. Yeah, so you think that these games were designed to facilitate conversation yes. between product and customers? Yep. Uh, as a software developer, I see these tools as very useful for developing Scrum teams. Yes. Uh, do they have any kind of shortcomings or something that really doesn't apply to, or can that even be dangerous to be applied to Scrum teams? So, what? Uh, how would you apply it to Scrum teams? We have lots of problems that can bring us down, stuff that we can solve easily, and stuff that just bothers us. So, you can use these, uh, this, this technique is very good for retrospective. Yeah. Uh, you can use this technique, uh, I've seen this used with teams on what is it about our architecture that we don't like. What is the technical debt in our product that we want to get rid of? All right. So it's anything that's just a drag. And basically, that brings me to the insight that I think we can apply this. To oh, absolutely. To right. Over here, insight. We have clustering. 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 In fact, that maybe there's a lot of things that are just mm -hmm. or the root of the sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, by making it visual, you can start to see how things are related. I've had that once with a client. It was really interesting. They had a whole bunch of things that were all clustered together. And I'm like, well, what do you call that? And they're like, oh, procurement process. And so when we went through the process of like, okay, which anchors would you cut off? And then the procurement process was like way at the bottom. They didn't cut it off. And this was like a whole bunch of senior managers. These were people that had the power to change the procurement process. And they did it, like executives. Like, oh, we can make this change. And I just said to them, I said, you know, your biggest anchor, you didn't even cut. <laughs> They're like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's their choice, right? They don't want to fix their procurement process even though it's the biggest problem that they all agree to. Sure. Right. Over here. Well, one thing that I noticed that uh, was happening in our group, that we were making very generic kind of post-its, mm -hmm. and the more we were talking about it, what would surface is, well, this could be good or bad, mm -hmm. depending on what your approach is or what you're trying to write. Mm -hmm. So maybe being a little bit more specific on what you write, mm -hmm. just to make sure what you think is good or bad, or why is it good or bad, would help. I think so. I think you know when, when you start out generic, it's then more important to pay attention to the conversation as a product designer. So when you're the product designer, or when you're in the product development and the customers are playing this, you are an observer, right? Now there is a little bit of a Heisenberg effect by observing something, you change it, right? Uh, I think it's the Heisenberg effect. It's from science. So I mean, by watching, by watching, by watching them, they know that you're watching them, and so they're gonna act a little differently. But it is important for you just to observe what they do and to ask questions because some of these things are generic. Like, what do you mean by focus? Uh, and, and so it's it's important to listen to the conversation. Right. And have more than one observer. That's where you can use the tech team. They can they can observe things. They can have insights. They might hear things that you don't. Final thought or comment? Okay, I want I want to show you something. In a minute. One more thought or comment or insight or question about the game. Yes. Good question. When you said about cutting the anchor off, mm -hmm. I thought it would, it would be useful to tell people everything you put uh, on the below sea level on the bottom should be things not to improve but new issues. Because, for example, I'm using a lot of our issues on the bottom of the ocean are not things you can cut off. It's the opposite. We have to dive in to change them. I don't know if, if by <coughs> you mean what's your weight that you really don't want to carry. Like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a weight you really don't want to carry. Yeah. So it's a bit different, for example, when you give the example of procurement. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think the company wanted to lose procurement. I think you said that they should change it. Mm -hmm. But if they want to change it, they don't cut it off. They have to yeah. dive deep and pick it up. That's that's an interesting insight. You're right. That's a good way to think about it, right? Some of these things aren't you're cutting, but you're diving in deep yeah. to fix them. But yeah. Because the, the, these things may have a positive and a negative side. So mm -hmm. we're talking about some things that have positive aspects and the, negative aspects. So this is a way to start to talk about issues and maybe not cut, but uh, find a little knot there yeah. that must be. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, again, I think you guys are really getting into the insights. It's about the dialogue, right? It's not about build, find it, building this picture. It's the dialogue about, hey, what's the insight? What's the, what's the positive thing that we can emphasize? What's the little knot that we can untie? Uh, up there, I want to just show you, you can play the, pretty much any visual collaboration game that you play with post-it notes on a, on a wall, you can play online. That speedboat that I did uh, for a client in Oklahoma, and we were talking about what oh. is it, right? And you'll notice they have a lot of things that they liked. And this is just, a, the tool is called Weave. You can play instant play games online, I believe. Uh, and you can invite people to this, and it's, it's identical, the experience is identical to post-it notes on the wall, right? Everyone has the same game board, you can uh, move these around. I'll just highlight this one here. You can have uh, comments. So you can have comments. It'll record the history of who moved them for you. You can have chat. Right? You don't even have to have any interaction. You can just all interact with chat. I've used online games uh, for uh, surveys doing with global customers like for products and services that are for where the, the customers are globally distributed. Right? It's quite, quite a good uh, approach for that. So if you want to know more about that, play games online, uh, you can go to Weave, look up Continuo Weave, or you can contact me. All right? I can help you get started on this. And someone else was talking about, I overheard this idea of, well, you know, we can only really come up with safe ideas here in Portugal. And there is a game called Safe versus Bold, where we think about what are, when we have an idea, where does it go? Is it safe, achievable, following, easy to do? Or is it a big idea? Is it, is it outperforming, leading edge, and difficult? So you can use, this is another visual collaboration game where you're using these words Think about our ideas safe or are they bold? And you can take an idea and say, hey, let's make it bigger. Let's make it more leading edge. Let's think about the difficulty level, all right? And to really say, hey, we want to get to bold ideas, more disruptive. <coughs> and here's four four factors to think about how do we get to more disruption. And this can be played online, but anything you can play online, you can also play in person. <coughs> With online, what do you think can be lost in, in the process? So I think what you you get uh, it, there there are different experiences. I think what you miss is a little bit more of the richness, but what you capture is more uh, complete ideas. Mm -hmm. So you'll get more detailed ideas written down but you may lose a little bit of the back and forth dialogue between the participants. So it's more about collecting data and putting it into the right place, and there's a little less dialogue between the participants. That depends on how connected they are to the idea and each other. If they know each other or they're really connected to the product, they may talk more, uh, but if they're really just, you know, it's more like a survey and they're just pretty random, like, hey, yeah, I want to go, I'll give you some feedback, then they'll just put their ideas up there on, on the wall and they won't talk very much. But they'll talk to you as the facilitator. Yeah. But this is, this is good, though, if you want to really get to talk to a lot of people and you can't get to where all the customers are. But if it's a smaller group, then this presential would be better. The, the, if it's online. a smaller group and they can all be in the same location at the same time, yeah, I, I tend to prefer in person. I tend to prefer in person. How do you engage the customers on these kind of games? Because most of the times they just don't care. We'll give you something superficial uh, to go deeper. So what are you what are you asking them? Though I guess the question if you're asking them something that's kind of superficial, they might give you superficial answer. So you're saying how do you get them wanting to play? A game? Is that how we do it? And playing with a, a deep connection to it. 
Sometimes what I will do is, I, there's a couple things I'll do. If the customer's unfamiliar with playing games, I will only, I'll do what they expect normally, and then we'll play one game, right? So we'll have a, maybe a half day session where it's, we're just talking about requirements in a traditional sort of way. And then we'll do, for 45 minutes, we'll do something like a speedboat. Or we'll do something like 2020 vision. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, not real complicated. Right? And, and what you ask them are things that you don't know the answer to. Right? So you want their insight into saying, hey, we have these items that we want you to prioritize. That's what 2020 vision is about prioritization. And we don't really, we would like your help in prioritizing those. But give them the things that you don't know the answer to. If you know what the customer has like 20 requirements and you know what their top five are, don't give them the top five. Or maybe you're gonna tell them what the top five are. <coughs> give them the ones that you as a design team don't know what the answer is so that, it, it's a, that you make good use of their time and use that insight to help figure out what they want. Does that help? And also in small groups? Yeah, groups of eight or eight or less. So if this was like a whole like customer summit, I broke you up into four groups. Mm -hmm. But online you don't have any limit. You online you don't have group. online you don't have any limit. Uh, it, I do try to keep to eight to ten online. As well. Yeah, I keep to eight to ten online, though I'll tell you with the study I did for the global the global customer. We sent out over a thousand invites, and about five to ten percent people only responded. We only had about fifty to seventy-five participants with a thousand person list, which is pretty typical. Five to ten percent response—that's pretty good. And then you have all the fifty to seventy-five together. Or no, we did wrap because it was global. We had to. I was up at two a.m. talking to India <laughs> from California. So no, we had sessions. There were four, seven, or eight people per session. So we had a calendar. We said, here are all the times that you can participate. Usually when you play online, people can only play one game for about 45 minutes. Same thing with like a speedboat session with your customers. If you're doing it in person, 45 minutes is the max. Right? So if you were to do, and so each game takes about 45 minutes. Right? And for online, I would only do one, ask people to play one game. Right. If I was in person, maybe two or three games a whole day, because people have other things they want to talk about. <coughs> other thoughts or comments? Uh, yes, uh, two more after. So you just mentioned the five to ten percent uh, response rate. Response rate. How do you mitigate the risk of selection bias then? So the people that are coming to give you the feedback aren't necessarily the people that speak. Because the people that speak the loudest. Other people with these problems. So what you're gathering is like. Uh, I mean. <coughs> so how do you how do you make sure that you're talking to the right people? How do you? Yeah. That's going to be that's judgment, right? I mean, you're going to have to look for trends. I mean, oftentimes every time I play innovation games with my customers, my own customers, I always find things that I did not know. Like whatever key assumption that I thought was like, oh, this is fundamental to what the market wants. No. <laughs> like the customers always destroy whatever sort of assumption that I have as a product designer, always. Now that could lead you, depending on the nature of your investment, that you'd want to play another game, right? You'd want to test another hypothesis. It depends on how much, you know, how much money you're going to invest and what's the impact of the decision you're going to make. So in your scenario, you're like, mm, I'm not really sure I got the right people. Are you investing fifty thousand dollars? Are you investing or fifty thousand euros or fifty million euros? If it's fifty thousand euros, we'll just go with my judgment, right? If it's fifty million, I'm going to want to do another study, right? I want to make sure that now I want to make sure I can talk to the right users and not just uh, you know whoever responded. Or I might want to do follow-up interviews. Like a traditional, you know, focus group, or a traditional customer interview, as you know, as a follow-on. Right. So just because you do games doesn't mean all the other stuff that you do goes away. Uh, one more question, then we have to decide what we want to do. One more question about either online games, about speedboat, about product tree. 
Okay, then. Uh, yes, you could last okay. for now. Sorry. Oh. <coughs> okay, so play the game. You have all the posts in your paper. Yeah. What is the next step? What do you do with this information? How do you make a decision based on that? You take a picture of that and then you take it to your design team and. Well, I mean that's where I mean that's where the pro that's where the the fun part of product design comes in. I mean, you go through and you look and you see what the similarities are, and you you make a judgment call. You say, hey, listen, a lot of people. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna look real quickly here. Risk aversion, feel of failure, cultural mindset. I'm looking at the heavy anchors. Understaffing, resistance to change. Clients too conservative, lack of vision, tech debt. Ooh, there's tech debt there. Right? Oh, I'm starting to see some patterns, right? You gotta start looking for the patterns. Focus, bureaucracy, right? You gotta you gotta look and see, okay, what are the trends with this? And and, and again, that, that might start you with a different hypothesis. Right? And this is really what I want you to think about with, with the games is use them to test hypotheses. Right? Maybe, maybe you want to run a whole different game on tech debt, right? because it showed up on every one of these. I don't know if it did. Right? Okay, well, what sort of game could we to understand around tech debt more? What sort of hypothesis could we make? Right? Maybe we could create a list of things that are tech debt and now ask people to prioritize that. Right? Helpful? Ish. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it is 8.34. There was going to be one more game around uh, called a $100 test. We're not uh, technique. Uh, there's, a book, there's a book and a website called Game Storming. So if you want more games beyond just innovation games, so there's like about a dozen. Luke's created a couple more since then. Game Storming has a lot of really good games. And here is a prioritization technique. Because I know a lot of product managers prioritize, right? And this technique says, hey, here's a whole bunch of features that you want to build, right? And you have some fictitious, it's American game, so. <coughs> but uh, you can have 100 and, what is it, $115, because the euro is stronger than the dollar. Uh, you have a fictitious $115 or 100 euros and you say to the, your uh, users, here are the features that we might put into, I, I'm not really sure what the example is here, but how would you distribute that money and why? Right? A different way to do prioritization. Right? And ask your customers, hey, how would you do this? Or your stakeholders. Uh, right? So that's just another technique that you can think about using next time you have to do prioritization. We were going to do something around prioritizing characteristics of a product owner, but I don't think we have time for that now. All right, so let's kind of move to the last step, and then uh, maybe we're going to continue on with the rest of the evening. But the last step was in my presentation was how are you going to apply what you have learned? The questions around, hey, how do I play games? How do you want to play online games? I want people to use games. Send me a message, right? I live here in Portugal. We'll get on Skype. We'll talk, figure out how to help you get these started. I'll even help you get started with online games, help you get your first one started if you want to do that. Uh, if you're interested in certified product owner training, the next class I have is August 31st and September 1. If you want to come, it's available. Uh, but stay in touch. I'm going to be here. Uh, if there's anything I can do to help you, if you have more questions for from our training, we're here to answer those. So thank you. All right.